Can video games be art? Yes, the cycle of this useless question being asked over and over again when anyone, even a little bit versed in today's cultural landscape knows that they not only can be art, they are art. Look, I had an entire paragraph in the script for this because I thought there is no way to evade this question, but I'm not gonna do that. All I'm going to do is take three core assumptions. Films are art, therefore God of War 2018's artistic value is a given as it achieves what films do just as well. Therefore, video games are art, or at least can be art. What I'm not going to do is qualify this statement. If you don't think films are art, then what are you doing on my channel? I'm also not going to expand on how games can bring more to the table than movies and how they can do that. That topic is way too broad and I can think of much better examples for it than God of War, except a video on this in the future. All I will do is prove that God of War is filled to the brim with professionally crafted cinematic moments and true artistic expression that could compete with mainstream movies in their own league. And I don't just mean, oh wow, look how epic this cutscene is, isn't it awesome? Instead, I will share my favorite scene of the game with you and take a critical approach to it to showcase how you can apply film's historical and theoretical knowledge of more than a hundred years just as well to games of today, to show you it's crafted with the same care and attention to detail as productions for the silver screen. So basically, this is not an exhaustive argument for the artistic value of video games. This is just a shorthand for the bare minimum argument that qualifies games to be critically assessed and be considered as artistic works. In this way, all we need to do is reduce God of War from a powerful interactive epic to just a chain of cutscenes that are connected with segments of juvenile entertainment and button mashing. And obviously, this is just to drive my point home. Imagine this video to be for those who refuse to take games seriously as transformative, cathartic experiences which, believe me, is actually still a huge group of people. I guess this is also me expanding Glance Value to be a channel not just about films, but possibly all media, and this is a first step of that expansion. Actually, if you stick around until the end of this video, I will also explain to you why my core arguments are kind of brutally self-serving, but I'll also tell you why I thought it was still worth talking about. But not before we actually dive in to show you the deeper layers of the artistic quality God of War carries in its non-interactive parts, which I think is interesting in its own right, regardless of your stance on games. So let's go. So what is my favorite scene from God of War? It's so hard to choose one. It could be the obvious one with the blades, or the one before that on the river. It could also be the first encounter with Baldur, the sharing of the wine from Lemnos, or Kratos pacing and pleading Freya for help with his sick son in his arms. And these are all deserving, and for another video I might have picked them. But today I want to talk about a beautifully directed scene that comes in at the top of my list of my favorite moments in the game. It's not some big epic fight or a great monologue. It's this quiet scene of Kratos having an honest conversation with his son about their true nature. There are a thousand ways we could approach this. We will touch on writing, performances, but more specifically we will look at camera work and music and how all of these things work in tandem to deliver this powerful moment with so many layers. Now let me just provide a little bit of context for these last two elements. So first off, camera. The whole game is done with a handheld camera and virtually no cuts, which makes for a really immersive experience for the player. But it does more than that. It also lets us get seamless close-ups, transitions and pans for dramatic effects to build scenes, just like a movie would. Arguably I would say it's even easier to pull off here from a production standpoint as no one has to actually hold the camera. And the transitions can be done so smoothly and effortlessly that it can be used in very creative ways much more without increasing budget for CGI. Music. Let me preface this by saying I don't know music theory. I can't even play the guitar properly. Regardless, I listen to the soundtrack a thousand times and I'm at awe. It's such an emotionally loaded, punchy, but also 
sophisticated work. I really spent a lot of time to try and pick up recurring instruments and musical ideas, otherwise known as motifs, with my untrained ears, so this will be my best attempt to recognize these motifs and transitions between them, but feel free to correct me if you have a better ear for this. So let's look at our scene. I'll point out the many examples of mirroring going on, where ideas and camera shots are reversed or duplicated, but you can spot them easily if you pay attention. There's something to analyze every second, but I'll try not to chop it up too bad. Roll camera. Get in. I will pull. You are quiet. Are you not better? I guess. I know you overheard my talk with Freya. You think you understand, but you do not. The blocking and lighting of this scene unmistakably points to the subtext. Kratos is in the foreground, taking up a majority of the screen and lit well, while Atreus is in the background, far from the camera, small and in the dark which signals his lack of knowledge. The way they are staged also form a triangle, again pointing to the subtext that this scene will be very important to Atreus as our eyes are guided towards him, but Kratos himself is looking out of frame, his mind is not yet with this interaction. The spotlight is figuratively and literally on Kratos for now though, shot from his tattooed side which reminds us of his blood-soaked heritage. Also, before you come at me saying that this shouldn't be a triangle, I think the boat guides our eyes too and it actually has some meaning to it as well, so sometimes I use it, but hey, if you don't see a triangle in the staging, that's fair. This is somewhat subjective and it doesn't take away from my point. Anyways, the camera's shifting focus and framing communicates Kratos' internal thoughts and what he's concerned with in particular throughout the scene, so we'll pay attention to that. Why do you say nothing? You said I was cursed. You think I'm weak because I'm not like you. I know I was never what you wanted. But after all this, I thought... Maybe things were different. So the camera pushes in and for the first time takes the focus off Kratos as he's concerned about his son not saying anything. This is further stressed by the fact that Kratos is now following our eye and starts the nonverbal conversation with his son. Atreus is still in the background, but Kratos doesn't turn around to look at him because he can't face him because of the guilt that he showed up until this point in the story. As an added benefit, it gives us a clear view of Christopher Judge's outstanding acting in the crucial moment that's coming up. You do not know everything, boy. No. But at least I know the truth now. The truth? The truth? I am a god, boy. From another land far from here. When I came to these shores, I chose to live as a man. Now, I'd like you to notice that we very deliberately don't get a reaction shot from Atreus, who just learned the crucial information and the triangle we were talking about finally got broken for a brief moment. Again, what this communicates is that the camera is not impartial. It shows us Kratos' state of mind at any given moment. This confession is not about the boy, it is about Kratos, and it always has been. It's his past and his fear that held him back all this time. Not as Atreus said, You think I'm weak because I'm not like you. But exactly because he's afraid his son will turn out to be like him. In the next few seconds, we will see his attention finally focus back on his son, realizing what the entire point of him telling the truth was. I urge you to look at Christopher Judge's amazing performance of Kratos here as he awaits judgment from Atreus and being surprised at his response, which is underlined by the music so well, but we'll talk about that a bit later. After this, he lets his guard down, further highlighted by letting go of the rope he was grasping all this time, reminding us of their dynamic, the father carrying his son, but now letting go of that responsibility for a brief moment. But the truth is, I was born a god, and so were you. Boy, have you nothing?
nothing to say. Um... Can I... turn into an animal? Can you turn into an animal? No. No, I do not think so. I'm a god. Mother knew? She was a god too? No. She was mortal, but she knew my true nature. Here, Kratos finally lets Atreus have his moment, realizing he is a god, as he comes into the foreground and now starts driving the conversation. To reflect this, our triangle from earlier is mirrored, as the conversation is mirrored as well. Now it's about Atreus. Kratos still has a substantial presence in the frame, towering over his son, but now it is Atreus who's staring out of the frame to give us a sense of where his mind is. Kratos is observing his son from behind while he contemplates his godhood, the reverse of their relationship just a minute ago. I'm a god. For a few seconds we even get a shot of just the boy slowly sliding into the center of the frame to show us the sense of adventure he feels, maybe even forgetting about his father who is out of the frame for this shot, which is the mirror of this earlier one, when Kratos did the same. After this, Kratos comes around to burst his bubble. Why did you wait so long to tell me? I had hoped to spare you. Finally, we get the moment the entire scene was setting up for with the masterful blocking. All the guidelines I showed you always missed something. Either the characters weren't engaged with each other, lost in their own thoughts, or they literally blocked out the other person to contemplate the impact this has on themselves. But now, finally, Kratos meets his son's eyes for the first time since he confessed and this opens him up emotionally, which is much more important for both characters than the actual words said. Facing each other, eyes locked, physical contact, literally in the same boat. This is what happens when beautiful writing and filmmaking go hand in hand to build up a cathartic moment. The last two minutes pay off for the player in two ways and amplifying each other's effects. In one, possibly more obvious way, it pays off consciously, starting with secrecy, but through increasingly open dialogue, reaching a new bond between father and son based on trust. And in another, not as apparent way, subconsciously, starting with ever-changing staging and the camera showing us how our characters are self-absorbed and uninterested in each other's reaction, to arriving into the frame together, finally completing the balance of the frame. When I look at this last bit, I can't help but feel the burden Kratos is carrying. His skin tainted with the ashes of his loved ones, dark, wrinkled, and looking at his son bright and innocent face, which probably fills him with a hint of hope that he will not turn out to be like him. But also the fear that his son will also succumb to the Greek cycle of patricide that we also see signs of in this Nordic world. Also, contrasting the earlier shot, here we see Kratos' side that doesn't have tattoos, maybe suggesting that they can start a new life here without all those troubles from Greece which is later referenced in the game when Mimir shares how Odin believes he can change his own fate, and so does Kratos. But no catharsis is complete without a final release of the tension of the scene, so after Kratos' warning about godhood and what I can't help but feel is a bit of a nod to classic Greek tragedies, we finally get to end on a hopeful note, both figuratively and literally, and that will bring me to discussing the music of the scene. Being a god. It can be a lifetime of anguish and tragedy. That is the curse. Hmm. What sorts of things can I do? Can I fly? Or turn invisible? I don't feel like a god. I do not know the reach of your godhood. But over time, we will learn.
Now I will replay the scene without interruptions to show you how the musical themes match the on-screen acts very organically with incredible accuracy. On the left side of the screen I will put reminders of the narrative beats I just mentioned, and on the right side I'll show you the motif that goes along with it. Most importantly, the transition between them is immaculate, and this is really telling us what Kratos is thinking down to the second. There's only so much I can fit on the screen, but pay attention to even the smallest changes in the tone. So let's go! You are quiet. Are you not better? I guess. I know you overheard my talk with Freya. You think you understand, but you do not. Why do you say nothing? You said I was cursed. You think I'm weak because I'm not like you. I know I was never what you wanted. But after all this, I thought maybe things were different. You do not know everything, boy. No. But at least I know the truth now. The truth? truth. I am a god, boy. From another land far from here. When I came to these shores, I chose to live as a man. But the truth is, I was born a god. And so were you. Boy, have you nothing to say? Um... Can I... Turn into an animal? Can you... Turn... Into an animal? No. No, I do not think so. I'm a god. Mother knew? She was a god too? No. She was mortal, but she knew my true nature. I'm a god. Why did you wait so long to tell me? I had hoped to spare you. Being a god, it can be a lifetime of anguish and tragedy. That is the curse. Hmm. What sorts of things can I do? Can I fly? Or turn invisible? I don't feel like God. I do not know the reach of your godhood. But over time, you will learn. And look, as I said in the beginning, I don't think this is what makes a game. And me analyzing cutscenes in a game is like taking the music out of a movie to analyze the music. But hell, that's what I did. I even took the music out of the cutscene to analyze it. But this is actually kind of my point. What we're dealing with here is increasing levels of complexity higher and higher levels of collaboration. To give you a very simplified example, books used words to create art, and then there were comic books, where drawings and words teamed up to give you catharsis. This doesn't mean comic books achieve higher artistic value, it just means there's a pretty good chance that after mainstream adoption, comic books will have award-winning writers and artists working on them as the medium gains attention. This is what happened to movies in the 20th century, and it is what's happening to games in the 21st century. Artists collaborating to realize a higher vision they just couldn't achieve on their own. Corey Barlog, Bear McCreary, Christopher Judge and so many others working together offering their own talents to create something bigger together. And notice how, again, I purposefully only mentioned people who are essentially making the movie part of the game, because this video 
is only about that aspect and that's why my core arguments are self-serving to such an extreme degree. The quality of these cutscenes speak volumes about the vision behind the direction of the game. You needed a whole crew of filmmakers to get this right. Lighting, acting, framing, subtext, special effects, score and much much more to achieve something that delivers the fascinating experience of a movie. And the fun, of course, doesn't stop there. But again, I will have to talk about the unique artistic value of games in another video. I think we can probably all agree that games can match a movie on a technical and artistic level at least, but God of War is special to me for many other reasons that have more to do with the content of the story and I hope we'll be blessed with more games like this in the future. I think there is great potential for insights on cultural anthropology, tradition, family values and how we pass them on, and parallels between civilizations and their religious foundations. If the execution and quality of the game remains this high, it can be a way to deliver thought-provoking ideas to millions and achieve something truly meaningful. Come what may, come Ragnarok. This is the first time I cover a video game on this channel, so let me know what you thought of it. I'll probably never speak of game mechanics too deeply, well, you never know. But from a narrative and technical standpoint, I think we can always discuss things, regardless of the medium. If you haven't subscribed yet, like and comment, let's discuss, and I'll see you on the next video. Bless. I'd also like to thank people supporting on Patreon from the bottom of my heart and extra shout out to Marv for being in the behind the scenes tier. I appreciate every bit of support.